and private sector partnerships and civil society response to rapid authoritarian transitions, military takeovers, and political instability on day three of RightsCon. My name is Richard Gaines, and I'm the Senior Human Rights Advocacy Manager at the Wikimedia Foundation, where we work towards a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. I'm excited to be joined today by a distinguished pan a group of panelists representing both civil society and the private sector. The topics of authoritarian transitions, military takeovers, and political instability are unfortunately on all of our minds as we watch the military invasion of Ukraine in horror. Friday marked the 100th day since the Russian invasion of Ukraine began. Since then, the world has seen an unprecedented mobilization of the private sector and joining a global sanctions regime in response to the aggression. Countless international companies have withdrawn from Russia or stopped doing business with Russian entities, underscoring a global rejection of Russia's military invasion and a growing responsibility among businesses to respond ethically to such events. Similarly, civil society and humanitarian aid organizations mobilize quickly to document human rights abuses advocate for the rights of victims, and to provide basic necessities to help civilians displaced by the invasion. Yet, these challenges are not unique to the armed conflict in Ukraine. In Myanmar, the military junta has crushed civil society and political dissent through a brutal crackdown that has gutted freedom of expression, association, and privacy, among other human rights. Um, this has occurred both online and offline beginning in early 2021. In Ethiopia, the Tigray region is experiencing the world's second longest internet shutdown. For more than 580 days, the public there has been in the dark as authorities censor and control the flow of information amid an ongoing armed conflict, making it difficult for journalists and human rights groups to document and raise awareness about human rights violations against civilians. Our panel today will discuss how the private sector and civil society can strengthen their partnerships in response to these challenges now and in the future. Before I introduce our distinguished panelists, I'd like to invite our audience to please share their questions in the chat as we move through this conversation. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Anastasia Zermont, campaigner for Eastern Europe and Central Asia for Access Now, as well as Kristen Flynn Goodwin, general manager of the Digital Security Unit at Microsoft, and Mike Cole, president at Siphon. Anastasia, I'll pose the first question to you to set the stage. What are the challenges that civil society has been facing in staying connected and safe on platforms, especially during times of authoritarian transitions and political instability? Specifically, when, when talking about this situation, um, Russia, Ukraine, and even Belarus come to mind as recent examples. Yeah, sure. And actually answering your question, let me bring the example of Belarus, because while uh, international community's attention has shifted towards Ukraine and Russia, the crackdown on civil society in Belarus is, hoping, uh, is happening both offline and online. As of today, two, uh, 1,221 persons are recognized in Belarus as political prisoners. And since 2020 dubious presidential election, 750 NGOs have been liquidated, either by the government or following the pressure of the government. Uh, their websites are blocked, same as websites of almost all independent media outlets in Belarus, and in general, expressing critical views and opinions on the governmental policies or actions, uh, same as actions of governmental officials, online can lead to disproportionate uh, punishments. One of the most striking example, at least for me, was when in Belarus, one woman was sentenced to two years of uh, limitation of freedom, for posting, as was defined by court, an insulting comment in a form of emoji. So just an emoji, and you are sentenced to two years in prison. Uh, of course, the situation creates a risk of self-censorship, and many independent media outlets in Belarus uh, decided to disable their commentary sections uh, on their website because as they told uh, the audience, it is impossible today to define what can be considered as extremism online. 
speaking of other risks uh, that users face while stay, uh, staying online, I should say that along with general cyber threats and privacy concerns, there are, ver uh, there are risks that are very specific to authoritarian regimes and to, uh, not only to Belarus. Uh, like I mentioned before, vague anti-extremism uh, regulations and laws uh, bans not only civil society and independent media, but uh, they actually subject users to very disproportionate uh, sanctions and disproportionate, uh, disproportionate punishments. Uh, while we, like, even sharing, likes, commenting can lead to a criminal offense. And why we need to keep such a close eye on this situation is because uh, the crisis can escalate pretty quickly. Let's just look on Russia. We consider that the situation in Russia is pretty concerning before February. But right now, when Meta is recognized as extremism organization in uh, Russia, when Facebook and Instagram are banned, when Twitter is blocked and TikTok decided to cease live streaming and other functions because of the fear of persecution, when most of the uh, VPNs are still available, but uh, each day the list of banned ones is growing, uh, this is this is a clear example of how we are downsliding from bad to worse. Thank you for your thoughts. Um, from your point of view, what are some gaps that platforms can fill to keep civil society connected and safe on their platforms um, in the face of all of these different threats where governments are using technical means as well as um, legal means, like you mentioned, uh, terrorism laws to, to stifle dissent? Well, first of all, let's agree on this. Let's keep civil society connected and do not disconnect Russian and Belarusian users. So keep your services available to them. As you may know, Access Now and Coalition of Civil Society Organization warned allied governments against counterproductive sanctions that would further isolate Russian users and Belarusian users from the free flow of information. And we are pleased to see that last month, for example, UK government responded to this warning uh, by taking action to ensure that people in Russia and in Belarus, we hope, retain access to the global internet and that social, uh, social media and news media services can still operate inside the countries. Uh, the similar approach was actually taken by Biden administration uh, who recently issued General License 25, excluding services, uh, software, hardware, and technologies that enable exchange of communication online from the sanction lists. But sometimes companies are acting on their own following the external pressure, I guess, and many cloud services, CRMs, even Slack, became unavailable to Russian users. Even tech donation programs through TechSoup, for example, have been suspended. You, may end, uh, you must understand that while Visa, MasterCard, and um, PayPal have left Russia, it is almost impossible for NGOs and independent media outlets to receive donations, to continue their work, and to use VPNs as well. So uh, this is the first thing. And the second thing is perhaps to uh, boost the security of users online. Uh, such initiatives like Lock Profile Initiative, the meta, for example, when you can hide your followers and the list of friends is extremely helpful. The disappearing messaging feature on WhatsApp recently introduced is a good practice too. Uh, perhaps platforms can also uh, give a hand to civil society with fighting disinformation and propaganda. 
uh, by clearly marking state-owned and control accounts, for example, so users can clearly distinguish between independent and not so independent information online. But since the same time, yes, of course, we need to secure accounts of independent journalists, not to ban them and uh, not to remove content uh, produced by them. Kristen, I'd like to turn it over to you. How is Microsoft managing its policies and businesses and, and repressive contexts like we're talking about? How does it ensure that civil society is able to stay connected to its services and that users at risk uh, can stay safe on its platforms? Thank you for that question. So one of the things that, that I do at Microsoft is I, my team and I specialize in studying nation state attack activity. So we specifically spent a lot of time looking at how Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea uh, attack their victims. Who are their victims? What are they going after and why? And what we learned from a lot of that is that um, so much of what governments are going after, setting aside the war in Ukraine, which from a, is, is a horrific thing from a human rights perspective and an anomaly from a data perspective, um, Almost 90% of attacks that we see are not against traditional critical infrastructures. Nation states are largely engaging in intelligence collection operations. They seek information and typically they collect it from uh, think tanks, NGOs, IGOs, and the media. And one of the things that's interesting is that civil society is right in that space. Right? At times, it functions like media, sharing information out. At times, it's a think tank. You know, e even working with the government or other partners to, to explore new policies or developments and, and definitely functioning like an NGO or an IGO. And so it's important to think about the fact that um, as a community, you are absolutely in the crosshairs of major nation states that seek to know information that you have and how you're going to use it. Um, we also see the... the these targeting uh, activities coming from uh, cyber mercenaries, companies like NSO Group. Last year, we did a, dis a disruption against a, uh, a private sector actor that we called uh, Sour Gum, Citizen Lab calls Kandaroo. And uh, we saw them going after uh, human rights advocates, journalists, uh, politicians, and, and uh, others in Spain and in other countries around Europe. And when we saw that, that those attacks were happening. We saw that our infrastructure was being used as a part of those attacks. Uh, we, we did one of the most fun things you can do as an attorney at Microsoft, we blew it up. You know, we, uh, we found the, the infrastructure, the accounts, the malware that were being used and, and um, we, we, we uh, eradicated it. And that's, that is um, a fantastic feeling when you know that you can have an immediate effect on an attack or a campaign like that. Um, on the private sector offensive actor, you know, that mercenary side, much of the intelligence collection focuses on phones, devices, uh, tracking locations and, and, and collecting information, a la NSO group. And so those are, are as, uh, as Windows Phone did not rocket around the world in ways that we had hoped, our ability to, to uh, impact issues at the device level is harder. Uh, but we partner um, with, with groups that are tracking those activities. And when there are, are indicators of compromise that we can go and do something about, we absolutely do that. Um, not only is it the right thing to do because of the cloud and cloud technologies, it enables us to be able to then push those protections out at scale. Because if a nation state or a cyber mercenary is using those tactics against civil society, they work against other groups. And so our interest as fast as possible is to get them into the cloud and then deploy them globally. That's a really important distinction. Um, if you are on premises, if you've got your own infrastructure and you're running your own backend servers and your, your, your own um, capabilities, generally you, that's gonna be hand-to-hand -hand combat against a nation state actor. Um, you know, the beauty of, of being here at, at Microsoft and partnering with the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center is that we've got teams that do nothing but track nation state attackers. When there's a nation state actor that, that we track that is targeted or identified or compromised a, a customer of ours, either on the consumer side or on the enterprise side, then we're going to notify them. 
And you know, that gives us the ability to um, make sure that we're making people aware as fast as possible of the attack activity. And through programs like uh, Account Guard, we can work with human rights organizations and inside civil society so that personal accounts, um, we can't protect Gmail accounts or, or third parties, but you know, Hotmail or, or, or Outlook.com addresses, you know, we can help partner with uh, the victim and with the organization to help share more context about what happened and prevent the, the effects of those attacks from hitting others. It, this is a, a really, really important area because uh, nation states are so aggressive in the intelligence collection operation space. They don't care what platform you're on. They don't care what technology you're using because they've been tasked by their government to go collect information and they're going to go find a way to fulfill that mission. And so that, that context is really what drives us to work hard to think about how do we come up with protections at scale and get them out as fast as possible. Kristen, you bring up a really good point that I think is important to, to really hit home, that nation states are collecting information and intelligence on civil society organizations, on journalists, and indeed on everyday citizens. Um, so these actors, civil society, journalists, citizens, they're looking for more and more tools that they can use to protect themselves from these sorts of threats. And so I actually want to bring in uh, Mike to this uh, question. Given the unprecedented growth of siphon use in Russia to for, for actors to protect themselves and the attempts to block it by the Russian government, what is your company doing in response to ensure that Russians continue to stay online and are able to access information um, in their context? Sorry, is that for Mike? For, for Mike, yes, please. Uh, there we go. Okay, hi. Uh, yes. Um, uh, now, so uh, Russia is obviously front and center here. Um, uh, we could go back to August of uh, 2020 when Belarus, uh, the the uh, Lukashenko uh, elections were contested. We um, saw a surge in use there as well. Um, you know, Siphon is basically the canary in the coal mine to tell you uh, how rogue a government is going on their population, because uh, depending on how uh, extreme the filtering is that they put in, uh, we get more people on our network. Um, in the case of Russia, you know, before the election, we were sitting at around 40,000 daily active users on our network, and within... Uh, uh, within a week of the invasion, we were up to 1.1 million uh, Russians a day. Um, our software is translated into 40 languages, so it's easy for people to, to you know, take a word of mouth kind of, uh, you know, uh, ability to go get the software. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, but that said, we we sharpened our, our you know, we got our chops up uh, in Iran and, and China over the last uh, 14 years uh, since Siphon's been around. Um, and we've you know, moved along with the, uh, with the way the internet has changed, which is uh, you know, people coming in with mobile devices and all the rest of that. Um, essentially, uh, what we do is we make sure that um, uh, our protocols are capable of evading uh, standard filtering systems. And then, and also when they do invade them, then it's a secure tunnel that is um, uh, wrapped in a tunnel. <laughs> so they can't even um, see anything, uh, you know, in terms of uh, anything that's going over the line. Um, so there's two, there's two aspects to protecting the person. One is to get them to actually connect, uh, which is to provide you know, Article 19, fundamental human right to everybody, which is electronic information, regardless of where they are in the world. Um, and... Uh, so you know, we've been doing this for many years. Uh, we do it on Windows and Mac and uh, iOS and Android. Um, so we didn't really do anything different when the Russian people uh, came to the plate, except make sure that we had servers that would work well uh, for that region of the world. Um, we we took the surge uh, on, and uh, as I said, you know, within a week we were 1.1 million. The um, there was a a play by the. Um, uh, internet service providers in Russia, uh, which was also actually telegraphed a year earlier when uh, Roast Telecom was uh, ordered to start to, uh, to implement uh, deep packet inspection routers at all their uh, spots, uh, as well as other ISPs. Um, but you know, this, um, 
this turning on the switch in Russia is a little bit different. You've got a world, you know, world class internet there. You've got uh, people doing commerce, as we've, we've heard about. Um, usually in, in Siphon's world, like we're helping Myanmar, we're helping Iran, we're helping even China, uh, which is you know, sort of in and out of the economic uh, situation, depending on how it is. But mostly it's sort of already disenfranchised people. So th this was quite a shock uh, for the world to see this happen to, uh, you know, regularly commercially viable things it suddenly went away in a day and it caught everybody's attention. Uh, now, we did see uh, in the middle of March uh, a, a major attack on VPN protocols in general, uh, which brought down everybody. Um, and we've been chipping away. We're now actually 1.3 million today. So uh, yesterday we had 1.3 million Russians on our network. So um, we're able to, uh, you know, our, our system is, is designed to um, uh, sort of auto automatically make adjustments to new uh, attack vectors and that kind of thing. I make it sound very easy, but it's, it's, it's extremely, uh, you know, interesting, uh, you know, from a computer science point of view, adversarial environment uh, to be able to get people to connect. Um, you know, right now we're seeing a new surge in Russia as they're, uh, as they're gearing up their DPI boxes. Their DPI boxes are picking up more and more VPNs and knocking them off uh, as they go along. And of course, people are moving over to Siphon uh, as that happens. Um, uh, so, you know, basically, we just do what we do. Uh, this, this, this is, you know, I can go Cuba, uh, Belarus, um, the late, latest surges. Uh, Sudan had a big one. Nobody really picked up on that one, but there was a giant uh, surge there. Lots of stuff going on. Um, you, what we do is just make sure that we have the capacity to take on these surges um, and uh, design software that's able to provide it on demand. Um, you know, in the case of Belarus, it was, you know, basically a four week uh, time period where the Belarusians really needed us. And then after that, there was a capitulation. There's typically capitulation against Cyclone because uh, unlike the other VPN protocols, um, uh, if you break Siphon, you kind of break your own internet in the process. So uh, a lot of, a lot of um, there's a very interesting interplay there of you know, people uh, constantly connecting. We learn about what connections work and don't work. Um, and then uh, at, at some point, when uh, you know somebody, some tech guy calls up and says, "Hey, you know, you want me to tell that into this uh, machine so I can get it going?" I can't because you guys have blocked all the all the ports, <laughs> and this turns out. So th there's um, there's only so much you know, an authoritarian uh, approach can take to this. Uh, ultimately, it's a battle of the people against uh, uh, against uh, a, a small number of people. Um, we typically find uh, that um, when social media platforms in particular, and most importantly, when communication platforms uh, get blocked, that's when you see people pouring into Siphon because they just can't not have it. Um, the, you know, the Russia one, I'm, you know, I'm at one we're at 1.3 million today, but in, back at the end of 2018, we had 10.5 million people in Iran on our network when the Iranian government decided to block Telegram in one day. So... Uh, this is, um, I, I guess the governments are going to learn over time that uh, you know, it's, it's going to kind of work for, I guess it, it, for them, it's a trade-off, right? Uh, is, is it worth um, breaking their own internet or is it not? Um, so I think over time, uh, we're going to see uh, constantly governments making these decisions when they're sort of flailing. Uh, but, um, you know, as long as the people keep connecting, I think the message will yeah, be pretty clear to them that they're they should stop doing that. Thanks, Mike. Um, Kristen, I, I'd like to bring it back to to Microsoft and and how Microsoft responds when there are restrictions or limitations or blockages of of different services um, in these sorts of contexts. So, our primary focus is in making sure that our our products and services maintain uh, accessibility for, for all and for all of our users around the world. So when we see an issue that is impacting our platform, um, then, then Microsoft's security and incident response teams get engaged to look at if, whether the, the issue is something that's impacting us on, on our, our network side that we can control, or if it's uh, external to us, then can we share that information about the external attack activity with uh, 
CISA in the United States, for example, you know, the Department of Homeland Security or others who can help uh, engage in response. Uh, that, that collective response and the community response is a really important part to that broader information sharing and, and ability to, to, to spot issues. So um, as far as, as how we, we play in the community space, obviously Microsoft um, will, will publish a lot of information about attacks and activity that we see either through the Microsoft Security Response Center blog or our other security intelligence channels. Uh, or of course, the, the fastest way to find out about what's going on from an attack perspective, Twitter. And so uh, we are we are hyper connected at all times when we when we see attack activity that we can go do something about it. Great, thank you. And and how how does Microsoft work to involve civil society organizations when these threats emerge, per, perhaps when they are specifically targeted? Um, is, is there an existing relationship or there existing channels that civil society and, and companies like Microsoft can, can use to, to engage um, in, in these situations? Sure. So uh, whenever we, we see nation state or advanced attack activity against a civil society customer of ours, then we will notify them. If you're an enterprise customer, um, then a part of every Microsoft contract, there's a point of contact for who we will reach out to. And we, we, we will call that person or find a way to, to get in touch with them. And we are strongly convicted in the belief that when we do a notification like that, we have to provide actionable information so that you can go and look for the data of what happened and the evidence of the attack in your own systems. Over the past, um, I guess, since, since about August of 2018, when we started doing these notifications, we've done over 60,000 of them to victims all around the world. And that number is only going to continue to go up over time, right? So from a, a civil society perspective, if you're in the cloud and you have a, uh, a cloud service of ours, then being really clear who, who you told us is your point of contact will be really important because when it matters, that's who we will call. And so having a, a, a primary email address, a backup email address, a primary phone number, a secondary phone number, those are all things that we will leverage. We know that on the, the individual account side in particular, nation states like to compromise email accounts and then enable mail forwarding. And so if you, uh, if you deep dive deep into your settings and you check mail forwarding uh, on your personal accounts, if you see that that's, that's checked, that's often a sign that you've been compromised by a nation state actor, right? So um, in those cases, we will force an automatic password reset and, and you know, we'll, we'll provide notification to the, to the customer, but you have to be careful that you are not allowing your account emails to be forwarded to a third party. So just from a personal hygiene perspective, that's something I always recommend people in the civil society space, just you know, set a monthly calendar reminder to think about your own personal hygiene check the settings on your phone, check the settings on your, your email accounts, make sure that, that um, nobody has changed any settings and even take a picture of your settings. So you remind yourself of what your baseline is to, to help you identify when something has been manipulated. Great, so keeping lines of communication clearly identified and open and always going in to check your security settings and checking them regularly, that's what I'm hearing. Correct. Uh, Mike, I, I would like to pose the same question to you. How does Siphon engage civil society and, and what do you recommend uh, for civil society to do to protect itself in, in the face of these threats? Um, well, on, on the civil, civil society point of view, uh, we, you know, we are uh, active in the internet freedom community that comes out of the uh, USG funding, um, which is, uh, by the way, super important. And the rest of the world should really uh, wake up and start to participate in this and stop leaving it just to the US Congress to providing the internet freedom funds. Uh, <laughs> but at least uh, out of that little pitch there is, um, there, there's, a, there's a vibrant community uh, People are constantly in contact, and um, you know, for example, we have uh, provided uh, we have a version of the software which allows anybody to uh, run it their particular site uh, un unblocked and that kind of thing. Uh, but um, I think on the civil society point of view, I, you know, I have to say we are part of it, uh, but you know, we are really about a scale uh, solution to the problems that that are here. We're not here 
to necessarily, I mean, I, we, um, you know, by definition, we solve all the individual problems, but each individual problem is of their own <laughs> like. And so, um, you know, uh, for example, uh, you know, it's free to download Siphon. Um, everybody can get on it uh, if they're part of the, if they have a contact anywhere, obviously. Uh, oh, and by the way, we're running um, Siphon as fast as possible inside of Russia and inside of Ukraine and uh, right now uh, as part of our, uh, you, you know, uh, thing. So there's no need for people to, you know, purchase anything or uh, to get faster service or any of that other stuff that is typical uh, for parts of the world where people can pay. So that, that, that's one of the things that we do all the time um, and uh, open up that stuff. And again, that's come through some uh, supporting uh, support through the USG funding uh, on this stuff. And, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, very proactive to make sure that these things are, are, are met and that the needs are, are met so that we can meet the scale problem. Um, I think there's a limit. That's why I was calling out the rest of the countries in the world to, you know, step into this because it's not really fair to, uh, there's G8, right? <laughs> I don't know why the G1 has to do all the work of the G8 uh, on this uh, internet freedom issue. Um, but, uh, you know, bottom line is there'd be nobody in Russia connected to the internet right now if it wasn't for the internet freedom program because none of the commercial VPNs are working anymore because none of them are designed to work in, in hostile environments. They're designed to get you on net, US Netflix. Um, this, is, uh, this is a fundamental difference in approach that uh, Siphon has been afforded as a result of the uh, four thinking of the internet freedom programs that are going on of which Access Now is part, you know, uh, been active in and the rights con comes out of. Uh, so, you know, well done everybody in that sense. Uh, here we are uh, able to uh, parry the, uh, you know, actually provide a viable service to people at a critical time. Uh, this is why you do it. And uh, here it is working. So um, uh, in, in that sense, we're, we're getting there. Um, uh, the, the real problem, of course, is uh, education beyond people who are um, who are uh, it, it, you know, acutely aware of how to get around these things and beyond the word of mouth. Um, you know, I, I can't necessarily imagine uh, explaining to my mother how to get uh, on the internet if Toronto suddenly was, uh, you know, uh, was filtered. So uh, th these are some of the new bridges that need to be uh, crossed in terms of uh, getting into the population scale stuff. But, you know, that said, I mean, the, the one in, in Cuba was mind-boggling mind to me. We had 1.2 million people in Cuba on our network. I didn't even know there was 1.2 million people in Cuba that wanted to get on the network. So that was, uh, you know, I think we were probably up around 60, 70% of the entire population was using our, our software. So uh, I think, you know, that, that's, um, that's, where, that's where we're coming from anyway. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and before we turn it over to the audience for, for questions and answers, I would like to, to quickly invite Anastasia to, to share her, her thoughts and experience. When civil society is, is under threat, how can these organizations and individuals um, get help. Uh, yes, thank you, Richard. I think at this point, I really need to mention our digital uh, security helpline, which is available for users at risk all across the world, uh, available 24-7 in nine languages. And as Kristen mentioned, uh, digital hygiene. Uh, we can help you with risk assessment, with checking your devices for vulnerabilities and malware, but also provide you tips how to secure communications on social media via email and also how to uh, secure file storage, for example. So please don't hesitate to contact us. And how would folks go about getting in contact with you? What, um, how can they reach out? Well, we have uh, the uh, special folder on our website and email, which we're happy to provide. As I told, uh, the service is available 24-7 and uh, also spreads the, world for, the word for our communities to know about this possibility. Great. Thank you for sharing that, um, that resource to our, to our audience. Um, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to the audience for questions and answers. So please feel free to share your, your questions or thoughts or observations in the chat. Um, right now, we've got a question from Justin and I'll go ahead and read that off for our panelists here and um, you all can, can answer um, from your perspective. Justin asks, what legal measures can be taken against national, multinational and state sponsored corporations when they intentionally enable authoritarian transitions military takeovers and political instability. We have become dependent upon our tools and access can be critical. 
but to what degree is the very corporate structure and legally mandated bottom line culpable and grabs for ever more concentrated power? I think I can start, if I may. Please. Well, uh, the recent Pegasus project revelations that we have already mentioned during our discussion have indeed demonstrated that as long as surveillance companies operate with no limitations and public oversight, no activist and journalist isn't safe from the authoritarian surveillance. Companies enabled uh, authoritarian regimes to implement internet shutdowns, uh, like US Canadian firm uh, Sandvine in Belarus. Uh, they, of course, uh, sold its digital forensic technologies to the authoritarian regimes, including such uh, firms as Celebrite, Kandiru, and so on. So uh, what we need to do is, uh, first of all, to call on governments to immediately place a moratorium on the sale, transfer, and the use of surveillance technology. And of course, we also recommend to adopt a sufficient legal framework requiring private surveillance companies and also their investors to conduct human rights due diligence and uphold transparency. Transparency reports can make a huge difference. I, I would closely align with these comments. I, I agree very strongly, but I would also encourage civil society to continue to raise concerns about the fact that governments are addressing these issues through the very closed door, very opaque export control process. And so the, the regulation of security and surveillance technology through export control means that most of us don't get to see and understand the, the detail of what governments are agreeing to before it then has to get implemented at the, at the national level. So taking surveillance technology and making it a national conversation, taking the, the moratorium that Anastasia is calling for and, and having that become a part of the broader public debate about how should these tools be used, if at all, in a, a civil society is a really important issue that does not get enough attention. And so I, I think that, that can, the civil society community was critical uh, when we were fighting uh, the, the boss and our original rules and export control. And it was a great collaboration between the private sector and civil society to go put pressure on government to change some of this. I think we need to keep that pressure up because it's 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 um, it's an area where it's just really hard to gain insight when um, the export control process is uh, is not the same as as a transparent notice of proposed rulemaking or comment period that allows us to have a, a broad public debate. So, Kristen Anastasia, from from what I'm hearing from both of you, it sounds like this. Um, this debate, this issue doesn't just uh, reside in authoritarian regimes or conflict impacted areas. These conversations need to be having or need to be taking place in more open democratic or developed countries where these softwares and uh, hardwares are being exported from. Yes, exactly. Because uh, we can't uh, simply say do not sell to Belarus and close eyes on all other violations and deals that are happening. Besides, uh, of course, sometimes when we name and shame certain uh, companies, they indeed uh, decide to cease their relationship with certain regimes. Uh, but at the same time, all the equipment that have already been sent and delivered to these governments are still in place and still in use. So like, we solved the problems on words and public statements, but not in an essence. Great, thank you. Um, another question we have from the audience uh, is regarding data. The question reads, how long should data live? If we cannot be forgotten, our data could change hands to parties we wouldn't want. Yet if everyone's data expires, historical records could be difficult. Would anybody like to respond to this question? I think this is a great question because uh, 
at least from a nation state perspective, right? I'm, I'm not a specialist in, in the human rights space. And so I, I do not have the history of, of the, the ramifications of those issues. But if I come at this from a nation state and cybersecurity perspective, um, you can't look further than solar winds for a great articulation of how long you think about attack activity. Solar winds was compromised. And then at some point, the, the uh, Nobelium, the Russian attackers, launched their, their uh, software update that went out to 18,000 victims. And so then in, in March, February, March, April timeframe of uh, 2021, that started to get installed on SolarWinds customers. The attack activity was detected um, in, in late November, early December of, of 2020. Sorry, I'm off by a year. You have to forgive me, the pandemic means I forget all my, uh, my years. But the broader point is we went from April until December of 2020 before that, act that activity was uncovered and victims being notified and really finding the depth of the, that attack in December and January of 2021. So at that point, if you are going back over your data, if you don't have 18 months worth of logs, it will be impossible for you to find out, you know, when did that initial compromise occur? How did the attacker move on your network? Did they move laterally? Did they exfiltrate information? And so the retention of that information is really, really critical. Nation states are, you know, there's a reason why they're called advanced persistent threats. They are happy to sit on a network for a long period of time and observe, collect information and remain dormant in order to be able to then go uh, activate an attack in the future. And so uh, the ability to have at least one, if not two years worth of forensic data becomes essential. Otherwise, it's trying to like it's like trying to figure out where somebody walked after it snowed, not only once but twice. And that becomes a real, a real challenge. So uh, from a human rights perspective, there may be uh, uh, opinions on this that, that I am not savvy enough to, to know, but from a security incident response and forensic perspective, that's just a, a recent example that's, that's worth keeping in mind. Yeah, let me step in in this discussion. Well, it's really interesting to hear your perspective, Christine, really. Uh, but let me raise some red flags here. Since uh, 2014, when the right to be forgotten uh, has been developed, in fact, we have witnessed how governments, especially authoritarian governments around the world, have misinterpreted and misimplemented this right in a way that significantly harms human rights and leads to more censorship. With this in mind, we actually uh, do not call governments to further develop uh, this right to be forgotten, but instead to focus on developing and reforming comprehensive data protection laws. And uh, from this fair balance of freedom of expression, uh, we think that under no circumstances might, uh, must the right to be forgotten be uh, apply it in a way to enable removal of online content, because indeed it will be used by the authoritarian regimes in a very, very bad way. We've got one final question from our audience. And uh, given that we only have a few minutes left, uh, please uh, keep your responses uh, in the, uh, the shortness of a tweet, 140 characters or less. Um, What's your advice for human rights advocates to persuade companies to open channels that will be crucial during crises? And how do activists get past company gatekeepers? Well, to be brief, I guess this is the concerns that need to be addressed to companies themselves they need to be open to this dialogue and we call on them to open these communication channels with civil, uh, with civil society because uh, those on the ground are the only ones who are aware of context and content uh, yeah that what's going on so yep <laughs> this is up to companies my uh, my, my tweet size response would be for it would be amazing if we could see the civil society community create an isac 
every critical infrastructure has its own information sharing and analysis center where all the key companies or key participants get together and exchange information and then they get power of force to be able to get a seat at the table with the Department of Homeland Security, CISA and other major sectors. I think that it would be an incredibly powerful thing for civil society to come together as an information sharing and, and analysis center and start having a, a larger seat at the table from an incident response perspective, because then you get response at scale, which helps provide uh, um, greater resources and collaboration at scale. And that's something I think would be really exciting for the community. Uh, yeah, I guess the um, uh, one thing I would add uh, from the uh, safe on side of this, it would be that, um, uh, uh, you know, we have to recognize that um, uh, most of the stuff that's getting blocked is Western technology, okay? <laughs> so so uh, we should keep our eye on that um, uh, and work with um, work within uh, those people, be, those, those groups that are getting, uh, you know, knocked out by this. Uh, when uh, Russia blocked Instagram, 80 million people were knocked off of Instagram. Um, this is uh, uh, something that, um, uh, you know, is, is, caught people's eye, so to speak. Um, uh, so let's, you know, understand that um, when these attacks are happening, they're actually happening against Western technology. I, I'm not really that, so like just, I think it's something to take forward. Um, we kind of take it for granted. We think, oh, Facebook's gonna work forever. Microsoft's gonna work forever. Instant, Instagram's gonna work forever. All these things are gonna work forever. Meanwhile, they're literally getting attacked by every uh, authoritarian government there is. You know, uh, none of these things can get off the ground in certain countries um, uh, as a result of it. So, you know, let's 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 keep that in mind. Okay, um, when we're um, when we're doing this, we're uh, the you know they're not blocking they're not blocking TikTok. So. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time uh, today. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists for joining us for this uh, important and timely discussion on how civil society and the private sector can, can partner to um, address some of these um, dynamic challenges that we face in times of conflict and authoritarianism. Um, thank you to all of our uh, participants for joining us. Uh, we hope it was a productive call and that you left uh, with some good recommendations on how you as civil society can, can best protect yourself. Um, and thank you to RightsCon and Access Now for bringing us together. Thanks. Thank everyone. you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.